Uh, well, thank you, Zell, for the introduction. Uh, it's nice to be back in Pueblo. Uh, I live just over the mountains in the San Luis Valley, so not too far away. Uh, always happy to come visit. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I gave a, a very similar talk uh, as part of the Aslan Summer Institute back in August. Um, and the theme of that conference really was this concept of an sake, but it's a perfect topic, I think, to discuss as part of Native American Heritage Month, uh, which we're in uh, right now. Um, the idea of mestizaje is familiar to some. Uh, I think for many these days, the word mestizo uh, is perhaps a little bit more uh, familiar. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what both terms is, uh, as they're kind of constructed, and then also uh, as they kind of modified uh, over time. Uh, but this is a, a topic quite familiar to many folks from the Chicano movement. Uh, I'll be talking about that uh, as well. Um, but a concept, an idea that is undergoing, I think, some useful criticism these days, uh, and also uh, and a useful term to kind of enter uh, a conversation uh, about the complex dynamics of identity as they exist in our present world. So I'm going to start for the first half uh, of this presentation uh, looking at the kind of colonial construction uh, of mestizo and mestizaje. Uh, I've titled this section on being, a little bit later uh, I'll turn to becoming uh, and so kind of turning more towards uh, the 20th century. So first off, to make sense of mestizo as a particular legal category in the colonial era, uh, I want to introduce you to these uh, images over on uh, the right-hand side. Uh, this is an example of a casta painting. So in Spanish, uh, casta, probably translated into caste, uh, that is a position within society determined by one's birth. Uh, so this is a category that persons would carry with them their entire lives, right? There was essentially no exit from this. Very different, say, from a class identity, right? Relative to wealth, an individual can uh, move up the social ladder uh, or down the social ladder in a class-based system. But in a caste-based one, you're essentially locked into place, okay? So ultimately, what we see in colonial New Spain, that is the uh, area that we associate with Mexico today uh, during the colonial period from 1521 to 1821, uh, is a series of ethnic and racial mixing that goes on. Um, I'll, I'll show you some of the close-ups of these uh, images here in a moment. Uh, but what I really want to stress to you is this idea that, for the most part, in colonial Latin America, racial and ethnic mixing was considered to be a bad thing. There was an expectation of racial purity held most effectively uh, by the Spaniards. Okay, so their ability to claim whiteness was a tool to claim power uh, and the ability to rule over uh, both indigenous and also African inhabitants uh, of the colonial enterprise. You'll notice the parent I have there at the top bullets. Uh, if someone was essentially uh, of half European uh, and half indigenous ancestry, they would have been considered mestizo. But that wasn't a rough kind of percentage, as we tend to think of the term mestizo today. Oftentimes when people say, oh, uh, my family's mestizo, or I have a mestizo identity, they're referring to this kind of mixed uh, combination of indigenous uh, and uh, European ancestry. But in fact, in the Spanish conception from the colonial period, that was a 50-50 percentage. Uh, if you were more indigenous, say 75%, uh, you would have been labeled a coyote, uh, which is exactly as you might imagine it to be translated, uh, a coyote. Okay? So you, you can get there, I think, in that terminology, an indication uh, of the degree to which uh, it was a right? It, it was a, uh, a, a bad status to have. You didn't want to be labeled as a coyote. There's another category that's lobo or wolf. Uh, these are subhuman, non-human categorizations, right? This, this moves you further away from uh, the upper end of uh, the social hierarchy. What we see in colonial New Spain, then, is the emergence of a so-called pigmentocracy. That is a system of rule based off of skin color. Right? The, the pigment in your skin determines not just where you fall within the social hierarchy, but also within the political one. Okay, so the only individuals who could serve as uh, essentially uh, the highest level uh, viceroy, uh, 
down to uh, governors and uh, law judges uh, and so on, were persons, in most cases, born in Europe. In Spanish, they were called peninsulares, uh, referring to the Iberian Peninsula. So persons who were from the Iberian Peninsula, fully of European ancestry, uh, typically held the most privileged positions within society. Beneath them, persons who were also of white skin, but born in the Americas, did not get to claim the title Peninsular. They were referred to as Criollos, uh, which we translate into English as Creoles. Oftentimes when you hear Creole in the United States, people think of Louisiana. Uh, that's a different sort of Creole uh, imaginary, right? That's the one predicated on the mixing of French uh, and indigenous uh, and other cultures uh, in uh, North America. But the term Creole essentially means uh, a European mixing with uh, the local uh, indigenous population. Depending on where you fell within this pigmentocracy, uh, the, the, the level of indigenous ancestry you had, uh, the degree of African ancestry you had, uh, that could affect such things as your taxation status. That could affect things as occupation. I mentioned earlier, uh, if you wanted to be essentially a, a law clerk or a law judge, you needed to be of white ancestry. Uh, but it could also determine uh, that you would be a laborer because of your skin color being relatively darker, the positions within society left open to you for work uh, were ones that were generally pretty taxing. Okay. Also, things like the ability to bear arms within society uh, was restricted by uh, one's caste position. So as you might imagine, uh, there was a lot of concern among whites uh, to allow persons of color to have weapons. Right? The idea being that they could use those to launch an insurrection uh, against white rule. So typically persons who were able to carry things like swords with them in society had white ancestry. Right? The sword was literally an indication of the authority and the power held over uh, non whites uh, and also a, a means to defend oneself against the uh, ever uh, present concern of a type of insurrection uh, against Spanish rule. Okay, so this was a society that was very rigid, very hierarchical, uh, and ultimately predicated on the skin color. And also, this is where we get the term mestizo, again, a legal category for persons uh, of a particular uh, parentage. This is a, a, a detail from a different past painting. I'll just back up again. It's very different stylistically from the one I showed before, but it gives you a sense of uh, the almost mathematical uh, focus uh, of uh, this sort of uh, construction of race and identity. So the one on the left in Spanish reads, De Español y India, produce mestizo. Right? So of an Español, Spaniard, there's a very fair skinned Spaniard there. And an indigenous woman, Una India, we have a mestizo. If you notice in this imagery, the skin color not just of the man, but also of the woman, the resulting child, right? Again, that fixation with skin color and pigments. On the right, we have the Espanol y India mestiza. So same combination here. One of the things you see that's kind of interesting is the difference uh, portrayals of dress. Uh, so the man in each case is dressed a little bit differently. The one uh, on the left uh, is probably a colonial governor or someone of very high rank. Uh, the individual on the right is not a, as high class, again referring to wealth status. Uh, but the women are dressed almost exactly the same. Notice the head covering, for example. Uh, so uh, sumptuary laws, sumptuary practices, how people would dress within society were also an indicator of where they fell within uh, the social hierarchy. So a real big focus, uh, not just uh, on um, one's place within society, but also the need to portray that to everybody else. Right? That was a sort of expectation within the society. In terms of our part of the world, uh, in the Southwest, some of these traditions carry very rigidly northwards. Historians, though, argue over the degree to which uh, the same caste system that was in place in Mexico existed in New Mexico as well. Okay, one of the arguments against a very rigid caste system in, in colonial uh, New Mexico was this idea that generally societies on the frontier have to pull together. Right? You're, you're, you're exposed in a very uh, unfamiliar landscape with communities that perhaps are hostile against you, uh, and so you're not able to 
sort of celebrate and recognize the degree of hierarchical difference that was very prevalent in a place like Mexico City, which is a large population. It's not as sort of as frontier as you might imagine a place like San Jose would have been. Um, so that's kind of the argument for why maybe caste wasn't as important in New Mexico. Uh, on the other hand, being as close in contact with so many indigenous groups could heighten a sense of difference, right? Uh, having so many pueblos, apaches, comanches, uh, in almost constant contact with the colony could mean that there was a greater emphasis on these things. Uh, so historians argue back and forth. It's funny, when I, when I gave this talk in August, uh, there was another historian in the audience, they're like, no, there's no disagreement on this point. Uh, there, 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 there was a caste system, and it was very rigid uh, in New Mexico, but I, I, I disagree. If you look at the literature, people go back and forth, and it probably uh, was somewhere in between in all reality. Not as rigid as we might have seen uh, in central Mexico, uh, but uh, not as loose as we might like to otherwise imagine. Okay, so what we have in New Mexico very much is uh, what historians also have kind of argued about as a frontier uh, or a borderline. Okay? A frontier is a place that is being incorporated into uh, a state or an empire, some sort of political entity. Okay? Its absorption is, in a sense, inevitable. It is in a process of being converted uh, into that other entity. Okay? A borderline is a more complex space. It's a space where there's a lot of overlap. There is a lot of conflict, but also collaborations. It's a place where it's not necessarily clear who is going to win out. Right? In a sense, it's very possible that New Mexico could have failed. Uh, it was pretty much on the verge of failure after the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Right? Its restoration in the 1690s uh, was a very delicate process. Uh, and so the eventual uh, presence of the Spanish uh, all the way into the 19th century was not something that was uh, for certain throughout much of the colonial period. One of the ways in which Spain is able to hold on to New Mexico and some of its other provinces throughout the Americas is through a reliance on indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples as laborers, indigenous peoples uh, importantly uh, as members of military expeditions, which is where I'm going to turn here in a moment. Um, indigenous peoples were very much a part of colonial New Mexico. Okay. There were different classifications also within New Mexico that we wouldn't have seen in Mexico itself. So the Pueblos themselves were considered to be a unique group. Uh, they, of course, had a unique status because of their sedentary lifestyle, right? They had towns, uh, they had demarcated space uh, because they had settled communities and they farmed importantly. Spaniards tend to think of them uh, as very different from other nomadic tribes. Right? They considered them to be you know, quote unquote more civilized because of their sedentary lifestyle. There were also the uh, nomadic tribes. Uh, those were considered to uh, essentially have never attempted to adopt uh, the Catholic religion, unlike the Pueblos, and essentially had it forced on them. Right? Uh, and then there was another group referred to as hemicycles. So this is a term that is becoming a little bit more well-known uh, today in the past uh, 15 to 20 years. There's been a lot of scholarship and efforts to get this term out to the communities. Uh, a little bit uh, beyond the academic domain. Hemiseros were the product of a slave trade. So yes, there was very much a, slight, a thriving slave trade uh, in Colombo, New Mexico. Uh, typically what would happen is that there were groups uh, like the Utes, the Comanches, who would prey upon other groups, uh, or the Utes oftentimes it was the Pikes, uh, in the case of the Comanche, or other groups uh, like the Pawnees. Uh, they would attack those communities, acquire slaves, and then bring them to New Mexico uh, for trade. Officially in Spanish law, trafficking in native slaves was forbidden. But they got around this by saying that it was a process of rescate. Uh, essentially, they were ransoming, ransoming and saving these persons from captivity. And that process typically involved purchasing the captive, baptizing them as a Catholic, and then integrating them into a household as a servant. And the status of servant could be anything from a slave, a true slave, as you might think of a chattel slave in the pre-Civil War South, to kind of almost a sibling uh, of the other uh, biological children within a uh, household. Typically, these were children in most cases. But they have a different status than other native groups within New Mexico, right? They weren't the product 
of Pueblos. They were separated from other nomadic tribes, unable to return, and so they had this unique category of being heavy sort of, So That was the classification that was used. So in New Mexican society of the colonial period, people would identify as mestizos, they would identify as anisodos, occasionally anisodos and mestizos would produce offspring, uh, creating even more complexity uh, to the world uh, of society in the colonial period. One of the interesting things, though, is that over time, boundaries between anisodos and Nuevo Mexicanos, or New Mexicans, typically that word Nuevo Mexicano was associated with persons of European ancestry, they blur. They blur over time to a point at which it's almost indistinguishable. By the time Spain loses New Mexico in 1821, Mexico declared or it declared its independence in 1810. It actually won its independence in 1821. Uh, when Mexico formally gains its independence, uh, it abolishes the categories uh, of mestizo and genisero and so on. So much like modern India, where the caste system survived well into the 20th century, uh, that Social hierarchy was ended with Indian statehood. It, though, however, continued social. Right? So even though by law the regulation of race and ethnicity uh, was no longer recognized by the courts, people in society knew who was of what background. So even though these terms don't have a legal sense after 1821, they still circulate within these communities throughout the 19th century. What I have here is a breakdown of the participants within uh, an important campaign uh, that was launched by the Spanish out of Santa Fe in 1779 uh, to venture into Colorado, uh, well, they didn't call it Colorado at the time, it was essentially northern New Mexico, in pursuit of a Comanche leader named Pueblo Verde. And that probably is a name that's familiar to many of you. There's an image of him downstairs on the, the mural here in the library. Uh, this was perhaps the most formidable Comanche leader of the 18th century and someone who really pushed New Mexico to its breaking point. Nearly 100 years after the public revolt of 1680, that is the year uh, the Comanche expansion is pushing New Mexico to the verge of uh, collapse. Uh, there's a governor at the, team, at the time by the name of Juan Bautista Lanza uh, who organizes a large campaign of about 600 uh, persons of New Mexican identity and also Pueblo identity campaign in the north, in time they meet up with some youths and also some Apaches, uh, and they, uh, in this kind of campaign uh, of uh, a coalition of sorts, uh, they're able to defeat Cuerno uh, Verde just south of modern day, uh, but very near to the town of Colorado City. You'll notice in here uh, that there are references to the indigenous participants. So that second to last column uh, at the very top says Indios. Uh, you'll notice that uh, an angry uh, reader in the archive actually penciled in the correct numbers because the numbers were not add up properly in this particular uh, version. Uh, but this campaign was overwhelmingly made of indigenous persons. By the time you keep factoring 200 additional youths and Apaches, uh, you get a sense of the idea that New Mexico's ability to sustain itself as a, span a part of Spain, part of the Spanish Empire, was really dependent upon the incorporation of the aid provided by native groups. And so this campaign and the defeat of Puerto the, the preservation of New Mexico, only happens with indigenous participation. What's more, uh, if you look under the, the number of Miguelettes, uh, so just to the left of the Indios, uh, you'll see there's a large number uh, of persons um, we can roughly translate that as uh, militia members, though if you look to the left, there's a column for milicianos. Um, these are essentially persons who are not part of the presidial troop force, so not full-time soldiers. Uh, the soldiers are essentially on the uh, left half uh, of uh, the grids. Uh, they number about 100 uh, in total. Um, what we don't have here is a separation uh, among the militia members between those persons who were uh, essentially Creoles, full white, and Anisuros, essentially entirely indigenous. Uh, by this point in the 18th century, uh, at least for military purposes, skin color appears to matter less uh, than it had at previous points uh, in New Mexican history. So there's an interesting blurring of the lines that's going on here uh, between persons of holding uh, their whiteness uh, and also 
greater inclusive sort of treatment uh, of persons of mixed uh, or predominantly indigenous ancestry into the fabric of colonial life uh, in New Mexico. And so New Mexico is becoming, you could argue, indigenized, becoming more indigenous uh, by the close of the 18th century, which is really the beginning kind of, a, of an economic takeoff, a boom period. After the defeat uh, of Puerto Verde, uh, the colony really collapsed. Uh, but what we're seeing here is a, a transformation then uh, in terms of uh, what it means to be Pueblo Mexicano, what it means to be part of the province, the colony of New Mexico. There's more and more indigenous influence uh, infiltrating into the colony and reshaping uh, what New Mexico is. One of the cool things, actually, first off, um, this is the campaign itself. If you haven't seen this, this map, uh, that's really quite terrific. Uh, so I um, don't have a, a pointer here, but if you look uh, on the upper, uh, let's say the upper right-hand side of the map, you'll notice that there's a line across uh, the map. That's the Arkansas River. Uh, so you'll notice there's a flag right on the Arkansas River. That's essentially where you are sitting right now in modern-day Pueblo. Uh, there's a little uh, banner just south of that, that would have been the battle site near Colorado City. Uh, just north of there, closer to where Colorado Springs is today, there was another uh, battle there as well uh, with the Comanches. But you're getting a sense in this map that the Spaniards are beginning to understand what lies to the north of uh, their colony. If you look uh, on maps uh, in textbooks, generally they show like the entire western half of the United States as part of Spain. But Spain really wasn't their presence much of the Right. It was more a claim to land uh, that was never actually exercised, except in rare moments like this. So this map gives you, as late as the 1770s, a sense of just how tenuous the Spanish presence in uh, the Southwest and the West really was. Um, this is kind of my area of, of primary academic focus right now. Uh, I'm trying to write a, a book of this campaign and piecing together all the, the, the mechanics of what it would have looked like. Uh, one of the conclusions I've drawn is that the only way the Spanish are able to get through the mountains, and you'll notice uh, the route of the expedition travels through the San Juans, uh, over Pancho Pass, uh, into the Arkansas Valley, then into South Park, the very north end of the map, and then the open plains, is through the use of indigenous guides. The only way the Spanish knew where they were going is because the Utes and the Nika Apaches knew the way to guide them uh, into the northern part uh, of the Rockies. Uh, and what today we consider to be Colorado. Uh, the Spanish had launched many campaigns against the Comanches and other uh, nomadic groups before this point. Um, however, they always came from the south. They would cut through Pecos uh, or through Taos and the canyons there that enter into the plains. The problem was that tribal groups knew they were coming. Right? It was very predictable. They just had to know where to look uh, and they could report back any scout uh, about the fact that the Spanish were coming. So the Spanish decide on this occasion that they're going to surprise the Comanches by going much further north than they had ever gone and dropping uh, into the Great Plains that way. Um, one of my arguments is the only way you can do this is with that indigenous uh, assistance. Um, what I haven't really been able to piece together perfectly is if it, it is strictly uh, Ute and Hikaria uh, guides, or if it is the Enisodos, who also know the paths of the mountains pretty well, uh, who are guiding this group. Uh, into the Great Plains. So again, the, the Spanish colonial project, right, the preservation of New Mexico, is largely dependent upon uh, native peoples, persons who we kind of collectively think about as mestizos today. Parts of that same expedition are later developed uh, into what becomes the Old Spanish Trail, which despite the name is not really from the Spanish period, uh, it relies upon routes that date to the Spanish period. I'll point to that here in a moment. Uh, but it predominantly comes around during the 1820s, during the era of Mexican rule. This is an effort to connect Santa Fe, New Mexico, with Los Angeles in California. Okay, these were the northernmost regions uh, of Mexico. There was a hope that they could kind of collaboratively together create a thriving economy in the north not require central Mexico to provision them uh, as heavily, uh, and so the, the, the path would have been to move sheep from New Mexico to the coast. There on the coast, there would have been more finished goods coming in off the boats in the Pacific, and then to return those finished goods uh, to, to New Mexico. 
So you can't go in a straight line, of course, because there's a very big hole in the ground in northern Arizona. And crossing uh, the Grand Canyon with a herd of sheep wouldn't have been very viable. So you have to go north far enough, uh, and also uh, where the Colorado is not as wide and as deep as it is later on to be able to, to move those goods uh, across North America. If you notice uh, the the line, uh, sort of the path that's the, out of Santa Fe, the most northerly, um, there's a dotted line there. That's essentially either side uh, of the San Luis Valley. So if we go back to this map here, uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a line cutting up the left side uh, of the map, a little kind of pink dotted line, and then the line on the return to Santa Fe from where Pueblo is, they cut through the eastern side uh, of the San Luis Valley. That route almost perfectly then co corresponds to the later route used here. So the very construction of the viable Mexico in the north is built upon these older Spanish paths, which are in turn built off of indigenous routes through the mountains uh, of what we consider today to be Colorado. Okay, so the Spanish and the Mexican colonial and imperial projects are really built off of indigenous knowledge, indigenous agency uh, that thrives into uh, the 1900s. Um, the very first settlements in the state of Colorado are also off of those same routes. So this is a very old map, uh, I believe it is from the 1850s, uh, of the area around uh, Pinecos County, uh, Colorado. So uh, Antonito is probably the largest town in that area today. You don't even know it's not on the map. It doesn't appear on the map until the railroad goes through. Uh, there are, however, settlements uh, like Green Sones, which appears here. Most people at the time they refer to it as Los Rincones, uh, where the river makes several bends. Um, these towns also would have been along that route, uh, that thoroughfare, first from the Anza expedition and then later uh, with the uh, old Spanish trail cutting into uh, what had been the most northern regions uh, of uh, New Mexico. And what I think is perhaps most interesting about uh, the settlement of this area uh, in the middle part of the 19th century uh, is again that story of connection to uh, the indigenous communities uh, in the north. Okay, so uh, the very first settlement that we think probably persisted uh, into the period of permanent settlement uh, in uh, the 1850s uh, was in and around uh, the three points. Okay. This was uh, a group of persons who moved northward out of New Mexico from a small town called El Rico. Uh, led Papata Nacio Trujillo had been um, traveling kind of seasonally from year to year to trap in the San Luis Valley. He, uh, however, told other people in El Rico, hey, okay, the good farmland is up there, you know, we want land, things are becoming tight here. If we move north, uh, there's this whole expansive valley that can open up for us. Importantly, before he takes the first group of settlers uh, in the late 1840s, uh, right in the aftermath of the U.S. war with Mexico, he goes to the Utes and he actually asks them for permission to settle in the San Luis Valley. And this is interesting for several reasons. Uh, one of the most compelling is the fact that he apparently asked them in Ute. So he spoke Ute. Uh, this could have been a language he acquired through trade. Uh, we know many of these communities on the northern fringe of New Mexico were in frequent contact with Utes. Uh, the trade between New Mexico and the youth communities of the north was thriving uh, in the 19th century. It could also be that he himself was Ute or maybe of mixed Ute ancestry. Okay? The persons who settled El Rito and those, uh, those towns around that portion of New Mexico, towns like Abbeview, in, town also, uh, in time also Ojo Caliente, uh, are persons who in the Spanish period were labeled as Nisanos. And so we had essentially have persons of pretty definite indigenous or mixed indigenous ancestry settling the very first portions of Colorado, which is an interesting legacy if you think about uh, where we are uh, today. And Colorado was really founded uh, by essentially Europeanized indigenous persons. Um, what I think is also really interesting from this part uh, of the state uh, are some of the uh, cultural sites 
uh, located nearby. Okay, this is a bend uh, in uh, the river, which you can barely see in the image on the upper right hand side. It peaks out for just a minute. Uh, but this is the Lahara Canyon, uh, very close to Kapolin, uh, Colorado. Uh, and in this particular section of the canyon, there was uh, a, a part of the wall that fell back, uh, and it created this kind of shelf uh, above the, the canyon uh, or Lahara Creek. And there, it appears as though for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, there were indigenous persons who were systematically planting medicinal uh, herbs and other plants in this one space. Okay. The reason we later found out about this particular site was because there were uh, Hispanic communities in and around the San, uh, the San Luis Valley who talked about this place in Pago Pica, literally the farthest. Okay. So uh, we know that essentially native groups cultivate this space that is then later used by the earlier, uh, the, the later uh, Nuevo Mexicano, Hispano, uh, Hispanic, Latino, however you want to think of the years, Chicano settlers. Uh, and so there's clearly some communication and shared knowledge going on in this particular space. As much as we might think of uh, the sort of uh, the native groups who are in uh, Colorado in the 19th century and the settlers as being two very distinct groups, you can approach the origins of Colorado from the south, from New Mexico, where we're actually seeing this kind of expansion of a cultural system that is partly indigenous, mixing with indigenous communities that are already in uh, the Rocky Mountains, most namely and especially the Utes. Okay. So what it means to be mestizo, what it means to be of mixed ancestry is far more complicated than any respects in New Mexico, in Colorado, which you can kind of think of as a cultural spin-off of New Mexico, uh, than we have in other parts of Latin America. Right? Uh, the level of uh, separation between uh, Europeans, between indigenous groups, is pretty stark uh, in central Mexico, but certainly in the colonial periphery of the empire, in a place like the Colorado New Mexico borderlands, there's a lot of overlap, there's a lot of complexity here, uh, and that status of being mestizo is a very blurry category. As neat and defined as it is in law, in practice, at least in the late colonial, uh, early post-independence period, it seems to be pretty blurry. Okay. So switching gears, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the 20th century and how this idea of mestizo, or being of mixed ancestry, then gets uh, reappropriated modified uh, and presented to us in the way that we think about it today. So first off, I want to talk about how the term really undergoes a lot of upheaval in Mexico. Not New Mexico, but Mexico itself. Okay? In the latter part of the 19th century, in Mexico, uh, there was a very strong movement against indigeneity. Uh, a, a group of intellectuals uh, and technocrats who ran uh, Mexico during the dictatorship uh, of President Porfirio Diaz uh, saw Mexico's indigenous legacy as inherently problematic. It made Mexico look backward to the rest of the world. And so these científicos, and you can translate that essentially as persons uh, of science, uh, persons of knowledge and learning, Western knowledge and learning, uh, really try to eliminate uh, the ancestral origins of Mexico. There was an effort, uh, much as is happening in the, in the United States during the same time period, uh, boarding schools and an effort to uh, eliminate uh, the sort of indigenous aspects of indigenous communities in present-day Mexican life, um, or, or in U.S. life, there's, there's a similar process unfolding uh, in, in Mexico. Okay. And then it comes along the Mexican Revolution. For about a decade, uh, between 1910 uh, and 1920, uh, Mexico undergoes uh, what historians talk about as the, the first great social revolution uh, of the 20th century. I mean great, not in the sense of being wonderful, but in terms of its magnitude, right? It's up there with the Russian Revolution uh, and uh, the Communist Revolution in China. One of these revolutions that just totally reorders the fabric of society. The persons that had been held, holding on to power during the 19th century, for the most part, the big exception being Benito Juarez, persons of mostly white ancestry. Okay? Because the Mexican Revolution was 
seem to be this movement from below, there's an effort to sort of reimagine the post-revolutionary state as embodying something very different from uh, what had existed before. Part of this enterprise is the, create, the creation of the so-called cult of a mestizo. This idea that Mexicans really are a product of cultural mixing. Uh, that to be a Mexican means you acknowledge both your Europeanness and also your nativeness. Okay. At least outwardly. Uh, there's more and more critique of this these days. Um, that there's a lot of problems with how this framing comes out, certainly from our more presentist um, perspective. Um, one of the strongest critiques today is that there is embedded in this a very anti-black narrative. In so far as it talks about the merger of two groups. But in reality, there are actually a lot of slaves in colonial New Spain. Uh, many Africans have been forcibly taken to uh, what becomes Mexico, uh, and so most Mexicans include a significant proportion uh, of black ancestry as well. Uh, the, the, the myth of the cult of the mestizo kind of ignores that and it focuses just on this merger of two people, uh, but in fact, the history is more complicated. Above all else, this myth is really predicated on two individuals. Okay? Uh, Perpes, uh, the conqueror, uh, and the woman who is various, variously described in, in records as his mistress. Uh, there are uh, various other words that are less flattering than mistress that are sometimes used. Um, this woman goes by a variety of names, uh, Doña Marina, which is essentially how she's referred to by uh, the Spanish. Uh, her original native name was Manantzin. Uh, from a combination of, of Marina and uh, Manantzin, we get Malinche, which is perhaps the most famous uh, word today. Uh, she is essentially this embodiment, this representation of, of uh, the indigenous world. And so Cortez and Malinche produce offspring, who is considered to be essentially the first mestizo. Their son is considered to be the starting point for all mestizos. In reality, of course, there was intercourse going on between the Spanish and uh, native peoples before that. But part of this cult, the, 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 this myth, uh, is recognizing this, this moment in time. It's also really problematic from a gender perspective, right? It's the European male essentially subduing uh, a native woman. Uh, and so, one of the critiques these days as well is that the idea of mestizaje is also rooted in a very patriarchal system uh, in which Europeans essentially subordinate uh, native people. Really, also in this framing as well, uh, native people are seen to be feminized right, through the woman as opposed to the European uh, embodiment uh, in Cortez. Okay. So even though the cult recognizes the indigenous component inherent to all Mexicans, it still says the indigenous part of the second okay. Ultimately, this is, this is the part of you that has been conquered uh, and removed, uh, and even though it's there, you need to kind of hold it in check. Okay. Of course, in the, in the revolutionary politics of the time, some of the subtlety is, is lost. Um, you, you see this interest, I'm going to go back forward just a little bit, you see this interest uh, in indig indigeneity uh, represented through art, right? I imagine maybe you have seen uh, the works of Diego Rivera, uh, one of the great pre-muralists uh, of the early 20th century. Uh, he uh, portrays the Europeans in not so flattering a form. If you look on the left, you'll notice them branding native peoples, uh, exchanging uh, wealth uh, over slavery and the transfer of land. Uh, some of the more expansive murals of Rivera also celebrate uh, the indigenous roots uh, of Mexico. So that is the image uh, of uh, the Aztec capital city uh, of Tenochtitlan. Uh, really this idea that the Mexican, that is the Aztec, the indigenous roots of Mexico is something worthy of celebration. Again, think of the scientificos who wanted to just eliminate that, pretend like it never happened. There is after the revolution this effort uh, to reclaim that past. Uh, in literature, this is embodied by uh, a man named Jose Vasconcelos, who goes on to be the Minister of Education 
during the 1920s. So, so think about this. You have someone who comes up with this idea, I'll talk more about the idea here in a moment, who's then politically in a position to push this out. If you're the Minister of Education, you get to essentially set the curriculum in schools, and so you get to sort of frame uh, what uh, post-revolutionary children are learning uh, in the schools. Uh, his 1925 book, La Casa Cosmica, is something that is referenced over and over again throughout the 1920s and 30s and throughout really the remainder of the 20th century. Okay? He talks about the people of Mexico representing a so-called fifth bronze race. So bronze being a reference to skin color, uh, obviously a skin color that is the product of racial mixing. Right? Not black, nor white, but essentially brown. For him, though, this focus on race is supposed to be forward thinking. He's not portraying bronze as a diminished color. He really wants to say Mexican people are essentially because of the mixture of all of these cultures, all of these races, are better than anyone else. At some level, it's chauvinistic, but it's also celebratory. Right? He's trying to say this is something that Mexican people should take pride in. They have essentially all of the great qualities of all of the peoples of the world uh, put together, uh, and there's something almost like a super race. He you notably know, does not use that terminology, but the early 20th century, headed into the 1930s, there's a lot of interest around race, super races, uh, and I mentioned you know, where, that, where that ultimately is. And this is inherently a very paradoxical idea. He is, on the one hand, rejecting an obsession with race, and okay? like, don't fix it on whiteness, but also offering another racial answer uh, to that problem. Right? Here, here's the solution. Right? People who are a mixture uh, of everything are actually uh, the best. It is, in a sense, predicated off of certain racial assumptions that go all the way back to the colonial period. Nonetheless, this book is really inspirational for many Mexicans. Right? That, that, that this is an embrace of the indigenous past, as much as, from our perspective, it might not be seeming like that uh, today. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, this was a pretty radical departure from the view uh, of uh, Mexico's connection to its indigenous ancestry. Flash forward to the 1960s, and here's where we start to bridge Mexico uh, and the United States. Uh, on the left is an image uh, that is on the side of the National Autonomous University in uh, Mexico City. Okay, you'll notice the face in the middle. The, 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 essentially, the, the three noses, the three mouths. Uh, what you're seeing there is that merger between the European and the indigenous creating something new. Okay? Uh, some of you are familiar with the mural uh, artwork of the Chicano movement on Colorado. We'll also have seen this image in many places. Um, the um, two black and white images are part of a booklet that was published during uh, the height of the Chicano movement. Uh, I got a copy of the document from uh, someone at Adams State who was part of the movement. Uh, she wanted me to uh, have a copy uh, of uh, something that uh, was very cherished to her. Uh, Colorado uh, artist, muralist, uh, Manny Martinez, uh, includes the same image on a lot of his murals. I'll show you some of the ones, uh, they're all around the states uh, here. Uh, you'll notice particularly in the middle image there, uh, the different fists uh, of different skin color, right? So again, this notion uh, that Chicanismo is kind of emerging out of this idea of racial, racial mixing representing something uh, worthy of uh, celebration. And in many ways, the Chicano movement is that sort of homegrown US version of an embrace of indigeneity within uh, Latino communities. Of course, the word Chicano is used to really recognize that. Uh, there had been a uh, Mexican-American sort of civil rights movement from the late 40s into the 60s uh, that was very uncomfortable about recognizing the indigenous ancestry. And so uh, oftentimes, groups like uh, LULAC uh, and American GI Forum, they really predicated uh, their advocacy vis-a-vis uh, -vis their status as citizens uh, and veterans. And uh, moving towards the Chicago period, it, it's less about one's uh, legal and social status and more about one's status as a human being, right? doesn't matter what skin color you are, uh, you should have the same rights as everybody else. Uh, and you really see that embodied by this effort to uh, transcend some of the color 
uh, of session had existed up until that point in time. So notice the, the shift here out of Mexico into the United States. We're starting to see the same iconography and same ideas uh, filter into uh, the conversation that's happening in the late 60s and 70s in the United States. Okay, this is an image, uh, a much larger image uh, of a, a mural by uh, Manny Martinez in uh, Colorado. This is uh, just south of the Herbaria campus, kind of a, uh, the core uh, of Colorado's Chicano community. Uh, you'll notice on the left, uh, kind of a, a more modern individual, I might say, uh, and on the right, uh, someone who's more representative of, of the native uh, ancestry and then uh, mixing together in the middle in this image of the, the eagle, right, in, in a reflection of, of the United States. Uh, so this idea uh, of the two world, the two cultures kind of merging together in the context of the United States. Um, and this one's from 1978, so relatively late in the era of the Chicano movement. But these ideas are very much part of uh, the, the conversation that's playing out at that time. Perhaps the most important publication uh, of the Chicano movement is uh, Jorge Gonzalez's poem, uh, Yo Soy Ma uh, Joaquin, uh, I Am Joaquin. Uh, from 1967, and here too, you see a very clear invocation of, of this notion of being of mixed ancestry, of being a mestizo, of this process of uh, mestizaje, of, uh, of an evolution of one's uh, identity here. There's a lot of dualism uh, in how he talks uh, about what it means to be Chicano. Uh, these are two quotes that appear in uh, the poem. The first one, I was both tyrant and slave. Right, this idea that you can be both the European, the person who conquers and colonizes, but also simultaneously be the person who was conquered. Right? Uh, this idea that your ancestors felt on both sides uh, of that moment uh, of, of contact and uh, cultural divide. Uh, I am an Aztec prince and Christian Christ. Right? So a little bit of the savior reference there with this Christ-like uh, association, but uh, clearly pagan uh, and Christian in terms of how the, the worldviews of the religious traditions look at one another from the indigenous side, uh, essentially uh, authentically native uh, versus being uh, this, this religion that was brought in. So you're, you're all of these things, right? You're, you're both things, but all of these things, uh, your identity is more complex uh, than you tend to give it credit for. Um, the idea of messy is really at the core of the conversation during the Chicano the Plan Espiritual de Aslan, from 1969, uh, is also emblematic of that. This is a document uh, that comes out of uh, the first Chicano National Liberation Conference that was held in Denver uh, that summer. Uh, the attendees uh, ultimately put together uh, a statement. It's really, the, the first draft is uh, the product of a poet, at least that, uh, and there's a lot of other contributors to it. Uh, but notice the language here. It is in many ways reminiscent uh, of us Vasconcelos, right? In the spirit of new people. Remember this idea of Prasa uh, Bronze, the bronze people, the bronze race. We do not recognize capricious frontiers on the bronze continent. We declare the independence of our mestizo nation. We are bronze people with the bronze culture. Por la raza todo fuera de la raza la. Chicanos. La raza de bronce. So there's this clear connection that's essentially being made there uh, between uh, the ideas of Vasconcelos, the ideas essentially coming out of the colonial period of uh, being mestizo, of mixed ancestry. There's not the legalistic formalism of to be this, you have to be half European, half indigenous, but really just an interest in the mixture. Right? Well, what defines you is really the sum of the parts, uh, not any individual perfect fragmentation. Uh, and another uh, author writing in uh, the 1980s, uh, Rodea Saldua, who in many ways is uh, one of the founding figures in, in thinking about the borderland, an alternative to thinking about uh, the frontier. Uh, she is a, a very proudly uh, Chicana lesbian uh, poet uh, and novelist uh, who, in a lot of her writing, uh, represents again this dualism. She talks about it as hybridity, uh, being hybrid. Uh, but notice this passage here. To live in the borderlands means you are neither Hispano, Indio, Negro as black, 
española, ni gacha, eres mestiza, mulata, half breeds, caught in the crossfire between camps while carrying all five races on your back, not knowing which sides to turn through, to run from. Half and half, both woman and man, neither a new gender. And so added to this conversation as well now, a, a look at uh, gender. If you follow the conversation around Latino and Latin X, I see and the X, the X is supposed to be a little bit more open-ended uh, association uh, with gender, rather. Right? Instead of being Latino or Latina, you could be however you want to consider X to be. So this notion of gender fluidity mixing into this is uh, about 30 to 40 years ago. So this is much ahead of the conversation as it exists today. Uh, but notice how in this very pluralistic mixing conversation about identity and, and how one can see them themselves, uh, we're seeing uh, a broadening of that as well. Okay. To wrap up, to kind of close things, uh, I offer this image from San Luis, Colorado, said to be the oldest town uh, in Colorado. Okay, this is a, a mural that went up at this point about eight years ago uh, from uh, a, a young man from San Luis Carlos Martinez uh, and his uh, uh, fellow uh, painter and, and muralist, uh, Jeff Palmer. I can't remember where Jeff is from. He might be from Denver. Uh, but uh, they, they put this mural up, and in many ways, it's harkening back to a lot of the things I was talking about, right? Uh, you notice on the left, the Spaniard, the European, See the, the, the crosses on the churches, uh, and then on the far right, uh, a sort of representation of indigeneity and nativeness. Uh, there's a totem pole, there is uh, this um, uh, face of like Quetzalcoatl, uh, the, the feathered serpents uh, in the corner, and in the mix, in the middle, you have kind of modern views. Uh, this was put up by a, a youth group uh, active in, in San Luis. Uh, and you can give that a plot, right? It's supposed to be this mixing of cultures produces shared identity, friendliness, uh, harmony. Uh, it is maybe a, a happy way to end uh, the, the story of, of collision of cultures uh, with what results from it uh, being uh, worthy of, of celebration. And no, but in, in many ways, what we're seeing is the continuation of these ideas, right? Um, this is not Vasconcelos' image uh, that is really deeply based on uh, a racial association, but it's really a reappropriation of that uh, to think more broadly about what it means in this sort of modern space uh, to be of these mixed ancestors, right? You're, uh, you're not maybe a wholly white, wholly European. Uh, you're also not purely indigenous. Uh, your ancestors are this mixture, this, this complex convergence uh, of cultures. In closing, some things to think about here. Right? So when thinking about mestizo and mestizame and these terms and, and how they're used today, uh, one useful perspective to think about is intersectionality. Social scientists use this idea, this term, uh, intersectionality, to talk about the convergence of multiple identities. Right? So uh, you can think about class and race coming together. This notion that uh, being a black woman uh, of wealth is different from being uh, a black woman uh, in a state of poverty, or being an indigenous person uh, who is uh, disabled is different from being a, an indigenous person uh, who is uh, not disabled. Uh, so one's experience of society, one's place within the world uh, is more complex. Right? We tend to put people into neat categories and say, you're this, you're that, but ultimately people's lived experience intersects with all of these different identities and statuses. Uh, and as we broaden the thinking around Mestizaje, it's less, again, narrow uh, as uh, it was initially conceived. Uh, and what we're seeing today is a, a more critical conversation around problematizing that. Um, also, this, this business about following, falling into gender narratives, again, this notion of the uh, cult of the Mestizo is predicated uh, off of uh, a pretty violent beginning, uh, depending on which uh, accounts uh, of Cortez and Malinche you read. Uh, they have a, a loving caring uh, for others. It's rape, right? So the, the identity is predicated on violence. That's one way of thinking about this moment. As I showed you in the other image, there's 
potentially other uh, less violent ways we're thinking about it. Um, we live in a world where we should probably be able to hold both of those uh, in uh, our frame of reference, right? We don't have to narrowly say it was this or that. We realize that things were probably actually more complex in real time that we tend to give credit to them uh, today. Um, I, I, I think Gloriane Saldua also invites us to think about where queerness fits into all of this, right? The very hyper patriarchal, uh, heteronormative murder between Cortez and Malinche really doesn't create a space for some of the complexity around gender uh, that Anzaldúa suggests that we uh, really reflect upon. And finally, significantly, anti-blackness, right? So um, the, the whole cult of the mestizo, as I mentioned, obfuscates or ignores uh, the presence of black ancestry, African ancestry in Mexico, right? It's just not part of the myth. Um, and so that has created an imaginary in Mexico, and I would argue also in the American West today, uh, that there's essentially just no black ancestry uh, in uh, the history uh, of, uh, uh, of the settlement of persons of Chicano and, and um, uh, Latino ancestry here uh, in the West. Okay. In fact, one of the very first explorers in the West, we don't talk about it much, uh, was a slave named Esteban. He was uh, part of the Cabeza de Vaca uh, group. Uh, he was uh, in their group of five. Uh, essentially considered to be an equal status, uh, but when they got back to Mexico, he was re-enslaved. Uh, and so a black man right at the core uh, of the exploration of the West. And we don't really talk about that much, right? We might imagine why that is. Uh, the history of black people in Mexico is largely that in the picture. Uh, even though we give a lot of attention to this idea of, oh, mixing, it's all about cultures coming together and the messiness uh, and the excitement and the, the, the interestingness that results from that. So, uh, I'll end there uh, and then invite folks to ask any questions that might exist. Let me go ahead. And then uh, let me ask you, Giselle, should we pass this around? We'll go ahead and pass this around. Let me start with to you. Yeah. One of the things that has always been uh, told us here. And so, do you see the issue of blackness kind of conscious, you know, like being wet, being light skin? Even in the family, you can have dark children and light children. Mm -hmm. You know, children you know, with different color teachers. Uh, do you see that as influencing the narrative regarding no blackness in our family? It's, it's based upon racism. <laughs> Yeah, so state quality is essentially based upon racism. So the, the, the question, I guess, is uh, to what extent do we kind of see this manifesting with its families, right? So you, you know, families oftentimes, uh, parents will have you know, the, the one child with much darker skin than everybody else. Uh, and in uh, this bank tradition, it's, it's not tradition, maybe it's over expertise, but in this sort of social uh, context, and in much that family operates with you is that that child is any kind of the embarrassment. The black sheep of the family, right? They, they're, they're, uh, there's a notion that the family is something proud of them because they don't represent uh, the, the, the true whiteness and possibility of the family. Because we're dead, uh, not just the Spanish world of the colonial period, but moving into 19th and 20th century Mexico, whiteness, fair skin, as being white or red out with a route towards social climate. You, you, you could attain high office and status within uh, Mexico and the Southwest if you were perceived to be a fair skin. Uh, and so uh, there's a tendency to, to see darker family members as maybe diminishing the possibility for the family to attain uh, higher status. Which also reflects in how people identify. No, we're Espanol, we're, we're Spanish, we're, we don't have no Mexican. We came straight off the boat, blood is pure. We, I, I've actually heard that stuff. Yeah, there's a, a scholar by the name of John Nieto. 
talking about the caste system. Um, who made that original determination when caste you were relegated to and when you bear arms, how much you were taxed, that type of thing? Who, who made that determination? Yeah, so it's essentially by birth, right? And it's particularly in smaller towns, everybody knows who's everybody's parents, right? It's just very tight communities. Um, the, the, the legal framework is set out in the Nueva Recopilación de las Indias, which is this massive compendium of all the laws that have been dating from the medieval period. Um, the Spanish crown is like, it's too complicated, there's too many laws that we've made. So we're just going to make one big encyclopedia like compendium of all the laws, and when there's things that are in conflict, we're just going to make one law. And so it's this big law treatise, which comes with the foundation of the legal order, and it specifically describes uh, values and things. If you're on a frontier area, a remote area, like Mexico. Again, the legalistic framework is less well known because not everybody had copies of uh, the Nueva Recopilación, so uh, it's not that you can easily go look up and reference. Um, but also, uh, the mixing of groups is different because the, the players in New Mexico are not the same as those on the interior of Mexico. So, uh, persons who are in sort of an official capacity, governors, uh, uh, they don't really have. Uh, a form of courts. They have people who would today can go as kind of judges uh, of first quarter of magistrates. Um, they kind of on the fly interpret things based upon cultural tradition. So it's a little bit more fluid and kind of malleable space in a legal sense in New Mexico, uh, which means that there's a lot of contradictions. Like at various points, we see um, the, 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 uh, the generation before the Atanasio Trujillo. Uh, there's a few figures who at various points are labeled as Andesos. And then later on, like 20 years later, they appear in the documents as Nuevo Mexicanos. So essentially, they became inserted enough into society where people were like, eh, hey, we'll, we'll look the other way and say maybe you're not uh, indigenous. So that is very fluid. Uh, earlier on, especially before the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, things were pretty stark, like the contrast between uh, the Spaniards and Pretty definite. So there's a, a drift that happens uh, over time. This is kind of a follow up to the first question. Um, I guess more of a statement slash whatever. Um, so, doing the DNA, for example, with our family, there is a disagreement within our family. I have, I'm one of 12 children. We all look different. <laughs> so, when I tell my sister, she said, Am I the same as you? And I said, Well, we're assuming we have the same family. So let's go from there. But um, so we're kind of a third, a third um, European, a third um, Native American, and a third um, from Mexico. So um, so when we're talking about this, we're like, I hate to label yourself, but when you go to Mexico, they ask me if I'm Mexican, and I say yes, and then we start talking. She said, No, you're American. So I'm like, okay, am I Mexican American? Am I American Mexican? Am I Hispanic? Um, and having this conversation with my siblings, um, one says, I'm Spanish. And they said, really? Because like, I'm Mexican. And the other one says, well, I think I'm Indian. And we're like, so what the hell are we? Yes, yeah, so it's all about the social construction of these identities, right? It's how people at various times can see uh, of them operating within society, right? It's really a product of a particular moment Time. And then as time changes, they can have different meanings and then in new contexts uh, or be reappropriated uh, in an interesting way. One of the interesting things with something like DNA is um, modern Mexicans, it's not going to come up as though they're 100% Mexican. Right? They too, in terms of the DNA, are a mix of European um, and indigenous and black and, and Jewish uh, and actually significant numbers of uh, persons who have Arab ancestry, there were a significant number uh, in the 20th century, um, more metropolitan places like Mexico City. Uh, so the DNA kind of works against how we tend to, in society, think of, of these categories, right? Uh, because we, through different political systems, uh, like the construction of the Mexican state, come to think of our associations as operating on levels that are very different from the way in which biology I have a response to it. 
I'm just curious to know, is uh, Mexico still using the Costa system? I, I, I've done the study of the Costa system, the Castigas and all, I mean, all the way down. But are they still using it and are they still separating the black community? I know they have a, their own community down somewhere. In, I think they're Afro Mexicans. That's yeah, one. So and, no then, and then New yeah. Mexico, again, I've studied their, a lot of their information and the native people, well, not indigenous, but I call them native people, they're called infidels mm -hmm. under their race. And this is as early as the 1900, 1930. So how do we get past that? Yeah, so, so first off, the, the first question, um, Mexico does not legally recognize uh, tax debts. So when, Me when, when the Mexican state was created in 1821, essentially, the caste system ends. Well, like I was saying with uh, India as well, right? There's a caste system there too. Uh, when the British get there, they kind of try to change some of the customs. Uh, but formerly, when the modern state of India is created uh, in the 40s, it does away with the caste system. But it continues today, right? People still marry within their caste, their traditions and occupations are specific to caste in modern India. Uh, and so, even though the legal framework that kind of structured uh, the caste system has been done away with, uh, as a social phenomenon is carried forward into the present. So if you go to modern Mexico today, even though um, legally there are not clear categories for um, Negro, India, Mestizo, and so on, related to uh, the Spanish period, people still use that terminology based off of what a person looks like phenotypically. And also in some communities, uh, there's an association. Well, that community has historically been an indigenous Indios, um, whether or not everybody in, in that particular community is, you know, the product uh, of uh, isolation and the way that might be living. Um, and then to your, your second question, now I'm blanking on where I was going with that. Um, the second part has to do with how do we get away from that? Oh, how do we get away from it? Yeah. I mean, we, uh, various individuals and communities and activists have been working against that for a long time. Uh, I would say it's an ongoing project. Uh, at, at some level, though, I think we use some of these terms because we think of them as useful, right? Um, I would say that, um, so one of the things that many people don't recognize about modern Mexico today is that there are a large number uh, of persons who identify as native uh, in modern Mexico, right? There's something like 200,000 uh, native speakers of uh, Nahuatl, which is the, the language of the Aztecs, right? So there are communities in Mexico who very much strongly identify as being uh, indigenous. In uh, the San Luis Valley, we have a large number of persons who uh, immigrated from Guatemala. Uh, they are identified as being Latino or Hispanic. Um, they're Mayan. They consider themselves to be indigenous. They speak Cangual. Um, some of them don't speak Spanish. Right? So uh, even though they're from what we think of as Latin America, um, in our context here in, in, in the United States, they, they don't see themselves necessarily fitting within uh, the community of Latino Americans. So in, in that sense, for them being able to identify as native uh, and not necessarily as Latino or Hispanic or Chicano uh, is important. Uh, and so we don't necessarily want to do a way with all of the language. Right? Uh, because they offer a sense of meaning and also experience, right? being able to get a sense of what that community goes through, uh, what its lived experience of life is important and informative. Uh, but you're right, we want to remove the bias associated uh, with the terminology. Uh, and for a whole number of reasons, right, our embedded unconscious bodies, that is a very long project that will probably take many more uh, years to come. I just have one comment to make. Yeah. Yesterday I was at Comcast because I was having problems. I received a call from well, I talked to a young lady in the Philippines, uh -huh. Irene Martinez. Uh -huh. I said, oh, you're, you're like me. You're Latino, you're Spanish. No, I'm 
Yes. She did not want to let me know that her last name was Martinez. Oh, you genealogy. So, just I end, you give me a lot of hope um, speaking about gendered research in your conclusions there. Um, my background is anthropology, um, archaeology, and um, I have read a lot of things recently where researchers, um, for example, discover a warrior tomb. And they imagine that the, the pelvis is crushed. They imagine that, of course, the warrior is male. When a woman scientist looks at the, at the, um, the information, she's saying, no, look, there are female um, artifacts in the grave with the person. So it's either a person who is female and ward as a warrior, or else a, a male type person who did female type um, work or vice versa. So it opens up the dialogue quite a bit and I'm hoping for, you know, instead of dealing with this narrative of patriarchy throughout all of our history, you know, I'm hoping to find somewhere where people can see maybe that matriarchy persevered, and it's there. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of promising research in that area. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to make sense of, so here's that list of the participants in the 1779 institution. Uh, they're, they're all numbers, right? I can name from Hans's journal three individuals Based on the fact that you've looked, there's one chaplain, one capitan, uh, one tambor, one drummer. Um, based on the studio records, I can identify two other people. Those are the only numbers that I can identify by name. I don't know if there are any women, because there's no way to actually tell that. Now, you imagine giving Western traditions of the time they're calling old women uh, who are part of uh, this, this, this list. Uh, Honestly, doesn't say virtually anything at all about the youth and the ideas of the uh, There could have been some women. He talks about them as warriors, which to me, in his European view, means they're probably all men. Uh, but one of the really interesting things is there's been some research of late on the Comanche side, and it appears as though some Comanche women did fight uh, alongside the men. And so we can imagine the engagement all male and possibly made up of men and women uh, on the Manchi side. Uh, but there's not really good records for that. But it's an tantalizing possibility, right? Uh, that the story could actually be more complex than at face value uh, and to conceive of it. Uh, so one of the things I'm trying to suss out here is kind of guided by some of the scholars that are quite too I think one of the other things that we're also dealing with is that social cultural perspective. Even in India, when we're talking about the caste system, there are still people today in some minds that there are groups that cons are considered the untouchables. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, even though they work, uh, are, you know, they do a lot of work with stuff, you know, you can't eat dinner with an untouchable, you can't share food with an untouchable. So even though there's attempts to move away from those aspects. They have become ingrained. And I think that's also has happened with identity. Uh, you know, growing up, I had uh, the Baca side, Spanish, you know, Baca can be traced to. And on my mother's side, well, here's the thing. My father was Manito, my mother was Sudamaco. You know, so there was a difference between my mother, I, I'm, uh, I'm second generation. My father, they have been here for generations. And I thought, and I told them, that's why I'm uh, being, talking about confusion. Yeah. You know, because I was both. And uh, part of that, you know, and I had to look at that framework. But part of that family framework 
it's kind of a brainwash. You know, it's like if you're the conquistador, you're the winner. If you're the Mexican, you're the loser. Who wants to be with the losers? You know, there was a, a strange perception, and I think. It's a, I, I teach Chicago studies, and one of the areas we need to get always into with Chicago studies is identity. Yeah. What does that conceptual framework mean? And I really believe in the 1800s when it was, in this, when it was wiped out everything in you. That also meant wipe out your mind for thinking you are. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know if that was a social uh, but part of that social construction, you know, that we started, that people started having an evolution of change of what their identity was. And like I said, I'm Spanish, I heard, I'm Spanish, I just, my family's off the boat and never met Mexicans, <laughs> Mexicans you know, which I love it when they have to do the DNA, because all of a sudden they say, oh my God. My great great ancestor lived in Mexico, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it is an eye opening and sometimes crushing yeah. for people that think they have pure blood. And what is that about? Pure blood. You know, the aristocrat, you know, a certain type of blood. Yeah, I think maybe it's a section with uh, being perfect, right? <laughs> Loss of control, loss of coolness, uh, uh, of, of uh, in a sense, uh, is probably the core of that. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that I, I thought was kind of interesting in the past, I don't know, 20 years, there's been a few syncretic traditions out of Mexico that are gaining a lot of uh, success. So, one, one is the Dia de los Muertos, right? Which is really a native celebration. Right. The, the Aztec celebrated the goddess still not seen uh, at essentially the same political day uh, as the Catholic saints, or All Saints Day. Right. So, uh, for Native people, celebrating uh, Dia de los Muertos is really a sneaky way of being able to practice their traditions associated with still not seen. And prior to us, we're being good Catholics, right? We're, we're doing, we're celebrating all of the saints today, which also involves uh, the color of orange. Uh, and uh, the use of scrolls is the same imagery that would have been around uh, in the colonial period. Um, La Llorona uh, is, is also it's rooted in uh, Mesoamerican traditions. There was a, a goddess uh, who supposedly killed her son uh, and then went searching for him. Uh, and that is overlaid with the story of the Spaniard who marries or doesn't marry a woman at offspring and then rejects them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, Overlapping uh, three different traditions, and of course, that's long really revered and celebrated in uh, the, the modern uh, United States. You know, here from Coco, right? And it's, right. People talk about it, they know that story, um, but in many ways, those trend lines are kind of pulling that indigenous history and that indigenous tradition right into kind of mainstream, and that's been an interesting phenomenon. Perhaps we can explain maybe 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, I really it always amazes me the number of Dia de los celebrations I see today. Yeah. Uh, it's just kind of cool. And I have seen it throughout my uh, tenure at the university, uh -huh. uh, the evolution of increasing uh, those celebrations uh -huh. and activities. Yeah. And more, more of the communities getting involved. Yeah. So it is, and I think, you know, and maybe that's part of the change. Maybe that's part of recognizing the different uh, perception. In fact, that, we were talking to someone, and I said, huh? They were talking, well, I'm going to go eat Spanish food. And, you know, call of us eat. And I said, have you, you know what Spanish food? Have you had papaya? Yeah. Have you had papaya? Papaya. You know, but they never had. Yeah. But, so it's, it's a bit, I, I don't know how, I don't know how to tackle that. Yeah, it's tougher. I am dealing, you know. Sorry, could you repeat some of what she said? Because over here we can't, we can't oh. hear. So she was saying that she has also seen in, in recent times, uh, in recent times, more of these celebrations uh, of things like Dia de los Muertos, but also uh, having the rest in 
classroom and um, as uh, a teacher uh, with these issues of identity is really complex. Um, we do a better job of it. I had a few things. When I went to school, and my voice carried pretty well, I think. I don't know. Me, no. me still. Oh, I mean, see. <laughs> All right, anyway, when I was in school, it made me a professor. We had to stay with families there. And uh, this particular family, probably most of them did, but they had a servant. And I knew that, you know. And uh, I was comment commenting to her that a lot of the women did shave their legs, even under the nylons, you know. I guess it was because they wanted to keep that Spanish, I don't know, to say I'm not India. If I if I'm India, I don't, don't have the hair on, on my body as much, I guess. I don't know. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, that was a trip. And then, anyway, another thing. Recently, my sister-in-law had sent uh, a text and this beautiful mural-looking thing. And it was like, I'm not Hispanic, I'm pre-Hispanic. Right. That's pretty cool. I like that, you know. And then the other thing which my husband had made friends with, Roberto Mondragón, you know him, no? From New Mexico, the singer. Oh, okay. Yeah, anyway. Roberto, I guess, had had a conversation with someone, uh, a woman who said she was Spanish and was arguing that she was uh -huh. pure Spanish, the pure bread. And he said, well, you know, when Cortez and them came, they did not bring the women with them. They did bring the sheep and goats, etc. So you're either a mestiza or you're a cabrón. <laughs> I love how you mentioned real historicals because um, since uh, Coco came out, you're seeing more and more young people trying to understand it. Even Oh, I didn't really mean that much. Yeah. And I love it. I love even here in Pueblo. They they're starting to celebrate more and more, not just at a Pueblo Museum, but all over. So I love that you mentioned that, you know, that 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 is becoming part of the realize it's part of our culture. Yeah. I I'm, I'm so interested in your chart up the the Mika Make it at this. <laughs> is that what that is? Yeah. Uh, how did you find it, it? Can you determine how many who's involved? And the reason I'm asking is my great great grandpa Lucero was in the Pesta. Anybody here know where the Pesta is? It's only 20 miles outside of Pueblo, and, and that's where he came from New Mexico. He was part of the military. I've been studying him for over since 1989, and I can't find him at Fort, Col Fort Lyons anywhere. But I do have some original letters from uh, from him to his wife in Costilla, okay. and he was in the Pesta Nueva Mexico okay. in 1845, okay. before, before they took over Las Vegas. So I'm very interested. I do a lot of, of veterans research about the New Mexico veterans. Right now I'm working on Pueblo veterans. But then that one really interests me. So my question, without talking and carrying on, how do we get that information? Yeah, I, yeah I'm happy to share this with you. Um, th this is actually, um, so we don't actually have the original of the Anza Journal. We have two copies. Essentially, he sent the, the, the journal south uh, to uh, the, essentially the colonial headquarters for the region in Chihuahua. And then there were two scribes. One made a copy and sent it to Mexico City. And we now have that in the Mexico City archive. And the other scribe made a copy and sent it to Spain so the king could read about uh, the exploits. And now that's in the Spanish archive. Uh, but both of them have this uh, grid. The, the titles they have are a little bit different. Uh, so the other one, instead of Miguelitas on the far left, the, the Miguelitas appears two times, both in the top and on the left. Uh, instead of Miguelitas, in, in that particular one, it says Minicianos um, from the, the district of San Carlos, which is a small little area north of Albuquerque. Uh, so putting the two documents together, you can tell you more than 
be the one to play by themselves. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty cool document. Uh, the, the town we're talking about here uh, near Pueblo uh, would have been named after the river. Right. Yeah. They call oh, the river the Arkansas, they call the river the Rio Mapeste. Right. Uh, and sometimes they put an L in there, so it's like the best play, um, which is uh, whenever you see things with TL, uh, oftentimes think of Mexico. But what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, the Comanche language and the U language are all part of the same language. U.S. ethnic language group, uh, and so those Indians are very, very similar to uh, Nahuatl, uh, to uh, Comanche, it's all a large language group. So it's probably uh, a, a new word, uh, I think it's the theory about where that, where that name for what we today call the Arkansas uh, came from. Oh, it came from the French. It was first the, the native group, and then the Osage. Uh -huh. And then the French came, and then that was kind of like Taos. Arkansas, yeah. Uh, you know how they used to have the trading and everything? Yeah. And so, uh, but his son was there. Yeah. And he didn't know if the Texans were going to kill him or if the Indians were going to kill him. <laughs> that, that's interesting because the, because I didn't, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. That's interesting because in reference to the name of the river, I've heard the, oh, it was named by the French, but I also heard it was an Indian word originally and that the French had changed it. You know, like uh, seeing a word and modifying it or something. Yeah. I, have, I don't know where I came across that, but it was in reference to who had originally named the river. Right. forward 
to some extent in uh, the history of Mexico as well, as Mexico kind of uh, is built off of the model of citizenship. Essentially, the 1824 constitution is kind of a cut and paste draw of the 1812 Spanish constitution, so they bring over a lot of the Spanish ideas about citizenship. Um, but if citizenship is exclusive and not something that automatically convert a certain person in the school, then that puts them beyond the pale uh, of uh, something that we're going to be talking about today. So as uh, categories like mestizo uh, disappear, uh, or, again, in law, not in practice, but in law in 1821, then there's other new categories like are you a citizen or not are you a citizen that also filter into how a person can be with their identity. So, and it's complicated, right? So, the French have like three different constitutions in the 1790s to try to figure out who is a citizen and who is not a citizen. Uh, Mexico has multiple constitutions during the first half of the 19th century, which in various ways kind of tweak and redefine citizenship. Of course, in the United States, you could be a citizen early in the history of the United States, but not be able to fully really partake, partake in you know, the democratic process, right? You have to have money. Uh, you've got to have uh, skin in the game, they would say. You have to have uh, property. Uh, in order to vote. Eventually, during the Jeffersonian years, uh, that notion of who gets to vote is broadened. Uh, the front franchise expands. Uh, for some scholars, if you're not able to vote, then you're not really a citizen. So um, that's a shifting category as well. Uh, it, it evolves uh, late 18th to early 19th century. Really, all around um, the Americas and Europe, citizenship is rewritten and reorganized multiple times. At the same time, some of these other categories are petering out uh, and getting new, new definitions. One last question. Yeah. I'm assuming you're, you're a professor under history. Is that correct? I am. I, I, I think you're listening to professorship at CSU. I, I don't know if you're in anymore. But you do? Maybe you can get it as a visiting. I would love to take a class. I'll be honest with you. I, I would. Well, this is very nice I would say. love to have a <laughs> yeah, you have a you program. Work with me as a visiting professor. That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would love to have I'll do what I can. Uh, <laughs> or, or maybe come down and, and, and do a, a couple of lectures or something. Uh, that's a wonderful idea. Uh, we're probably competing for him. I'm not sure <laughs> his school would uh, let him. Uh, yeah, that was my question. <laughs> <laughs> but you're in San Luis. You're in Adam State, right? Yeah, Adam State in Alamosa. Yeah, and Very he has fun. come here and he gave a presentation. Did you tell me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That you gave a presentation at the Otslan Research Institute and it was wonderful. And stuff. Yeah, so that, that was back in August, the first uh, right. iteration of this that I gave. Uh, and that's a, a great center, so essentially they, they do a lot of programming, once again, the Atlan Center uh, at CSU Pueblo, uh, and I think the event that I took part in in August is probably going to continue right. uh, Summer Institute, so we have a lookout for more information about the 2024 offering. Um, I'll be there, I don't know that I'll be speaking, but uh, I'll be there along with a whole bunch of other folks, it's a good, uh, good event as well. And he did our opening. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for coming today also with us. Thank see you what you buddy. started. And you see what you started? Thank you. So for those watching online, um, the presentation was on mute for the first few minutes, so I just wanted to repeat what I said, yeah. You have to love and hate that few but no. Um, uh, Dr. Sainz is from Adams State University. He teaches at the History Department. Um, he is a great asset to us in terms of history, identity, and genealogy. We're very thankful that he's here in Pueblo today. Thank you for watching. Thank you.